This is gonna be the supplement protocol to stay lean year round. This is not magical fat burning supplements. That's not what I'm talking about at all. Okay, the whole purpose of this series that we're doing this week is to talk about mitochondrial biogenesis and mitochondrial efficiency to ultimately create more fat burning potential within your body. The reason that I believe I stay lean year round is because I take care of my mitochondria and I focus on training efforts, nutritional efforts, supplementation efforts, and recovery efforts to really make sure that my mitochondria is healthy. That is where we ultimately utilize fat for fuel. So if we have more of it, it's great. So this video is about the supplements that are going to enhance how your mitochondria works, how much fat it can utilize for fuel, but also help support mitochondrial biogenesis and create more of it, but also help combat the negative aspect of the reactive oxygen species that can occur when we consume excess food. Point is, this is part three in a five-part series. We talked about the nutritional protocol to stay lean year round. Then we talked about the exercise protocol to stay lean year round. Now we're talking supplements. Tomorrow we're gonna to talk recovery and I encourage you to watch this in a series so that it all makes sense. Please do hit that red subscribe button and then please hit that bell icon so you never ever miss our daily videos. That'll turn on notifications, make you part of the notification squad so you can be part of the fam. All right, first one we wanna talk about, carnitine but you're only gonna be taking carnitine on the days that you're eating. If you remember that nutritional protocol I talked about, only take it on your surplus days. Now, carnitine is interesting because most people will tell you carnitine is cool because it helps shuttle fat into the mitochondria. And that's true, it does do that, okay? Carnitine palmitoyl transferase is an enzyme and a process that involves carnitine that takes fat from your bloodstream, puts it into the mitochondria to allow it to be burned. But you're usually not deficient enough in carnitine to have that process impaired. More importantly, what carnitine does is it sort of works as an endogenous antioxidant to help remove the toxic accumulation of acetyl-coenzyme A that accumulates in the mitochondria. What that means to you in simple terms is when you're using your mitochondria, you have a buildup of toxins that come and this is going to help clear them out. That's why I'm a fan of it. Now additionally, in that same vein, it suppresses the mitochondrial membrane damage that occurs. Okay, so let me put it like this. You're working all this effort to create lots of mitochondria, okay? Well, that means that you have more potential risk for that mitochondria to become sour and bad. And dysfunctional mitochondria, we talked about in the first video, could be the big link to obesity and a lot of metabolic disease, right? So we wanna focus on that, make sure we're taking care of it. So if we can protect the mitochondrial membrane when we know we are consuming more food and know we are eliciting a stress response, we can help ourselves out a little bit. That's why I don't say take carnitine all the time. Take it on your training days, take it on your eating days so that you help combat the reactive oxygen species that occurs as a result of eating extra food. The next one we have to talk about is magnesium. Now, realistically, I could probably talk for like 16 hours on magnesium because it's involved in over 300 different enzymatic processes within the body and it's important. But when it comes down to, again, we're trying to create more mitochondria, more efficient mitochondria to burn more fat, how is it involved there? So when we are working out or we're training, we damage our mitochondria. When we stress ourselves out through physical training, our mitochondria actually gets damaged, but it has a unique ability to repair itself. And when it repairs itself, it generally gets stronger. It's just like any kind of training adaptation. Well, this is cool, but if you're deficient in anything, then you're gonna have a problem. And magnesium is a cofactor in what is required to actually allow that mitochondria to repair. If we don't have magnesium, we don't have the cofactor to allow that mitochondrial repair in the first place. So you're training, you're putting all this effort into creating good mitochondria, but then you try to get it stronger and more efficient, and you can't seem to allow that recovery because you're deficient in magnesium. Well, guess what? The more active that you are, the more that you are moving your body, the more magnesium you are going to oxidize and utilize, therefore the more magnesium that you need. So I recommend about 400 milligrams of dimagnesium malate uh, per day, whether it's fasting, low carb day, regular eating day, whatever. Just keep your levels nice and level and high. The next one is vitamin D, and it's another one of those ones where, yes, I could talk about it in a million different ways. But again, focusing on the mitochondrial piece, there's some interesting science here, and I know that you all love science, that's why you're here. Okay, vitamin D is required in the mitochondria's ability to resynthesize or uh, restore phosphocreatine levels. What that means to you is when you're working out or when you're moving, your mitochondria doesn't just use carbs and it doesn't just use fats. It uses a magical fairy dust called phosphocreatine, which is just like you've probably heard before, creatine. Creatine gives it quick bursts of energy and it exhausts it very fast. 
Once it uses that creatine, it goes through a cycle of restoring that creatine within itself. Well, sometimes if a mitochondria isn't working really well, it takes a while to restore that creatine. Well, it turns out that the amount of time that it takes mitochondria to restore its phosphocreatine levels is a very strong indicator of how healthy a mitochondria is as far as efficiency is concerned. Okay, so if a mitochondria takes a long time to restore creatine, it's a sign that it's an unhealthy mitochondria. Turns out there's an interesting study that showed that vitamin D supplementation reduced the amount of time it took mitochondria to restore creatine levels from 34.4 seconds all the way down to 27.8 seconds. That's a big reduction in time. It made the mitochondria faster, consequently a more efficient mitochondria. Just another reason why in this whole grand scheme of this whole protocol, and staying lean year-round series, it makes sense to take in vitamin D. Next up, I'll touch on this one for just a second. N-acetylcysteine or glutathione, again, only on your heavy training days or your heavy eating days. I don't want you to get hooked on taking glutathione or N-acetylcysteine because even though some people will say you don't develop a tolerance to them, I don't want you to take a bunch of antioxidants. All they are are powerful antioxidants and or precursors to antioxidants, and they're important to neutralize some of the free radicals that might occur, again, on the day that you are eating excess calories on purpose, right? So just keep that to a minimum. That's optional, but it does help. The one that's next is one of my personal favorites, and that's coenzyme Q10. And whether you're following this protocol or not, I do recommend between 300 and 600 milligrams per day of coenzyme Q10. Ideally, getting it through whole food sources if you can, but supplementation if you need to. Uh, I did put a link down below, Thrive Market, uh, has a lot of foods that are rich in coenzyme Q10. They're an online membership-based grocery store. They've got all like your pantry essentials, and I've created keto boxes, fasting boxes. They've supported this series. They've helped sponsor this channel, and they are awesome. So all of my pantry goods and everything I get through Thrive, they now have frozen food options as well, so like primal food meals, things like that. Highly recommend you check them out down below in the description if you wanna see the kinds of things that I would normally get at the grocery store. So check them out down below after you watch this video. Again, gets delivered right to your doorstep, makes it super easy, no more going to the grocery store, no more wasting money on gas, super awesome. And all the things that I talk about, they usually have in stock, so super cool. So coenzyme Q10 does a few things, okay? It protects mitochondrial biogenesis, okay? So it makes sure that that happens in an effective way. But I think the thing we wanna focus on the most is the electron transport chain. Okay, when the mitochondria is receiving energy, you have electrons that are transported to the mitochondria to create energy. Okay, they transport down what's called the electron transport chain. Coenzyme Q10 is like a big catcher's mitt that catches the electrons and makes sure they get to the right place. If you have a smaller catcher's mitt, you have more electrons that don't get caught. And when those electrons don't get caught, they run amok throughout your body like bullets, causing all kinds of damage and poking holes and things. And that's, although an exaggeration, in some degree it's quite literal, okay? It's a heavy, heavy reactive oxygen species and a heavy oxidative load on the body. So what we need to do is make sure that those electrons are not going rogue and they're just getting caught. Okay, so what happens is coenzyme Q10 gives them a bigger net to catch. Okay, basically makes it so the electrons get caught and the mitochondria can operate at some maximum efficiency and you have less reactive oxygen species floating around. It's very difficult for your body to endogenously make coenzyme Q10 after you uh, start to age. So after the age of 30, it gets a little bit more difficult. So supplementing it becomes more and more important, not only for heart health, but of course for this energy processing and for ultimately fat burning. Then we look at the other side of the equation with that. Coenzyme Q10 works really well with alpha lipoic acid. Alpha lipoic acid is almost like the pitcher versus the catcher. It helps throw the electron a little bit better and make sure that it goes in the right direction but it also is involved in creating the enzymes that actually make ATP in the first place. So I usually like to recommend coenzyme Q10 in conjunction with alpha lipoic acid. Coenzyme Q10, again, 300, 600 milligrams, alpha lipoic acid, uh, one to 200, you don't even need much. Then we have an interesting one called PQQ. This is one that I just added to my arsenal within the last four or five months, okay? PQQ is cool because it helps elevate, again, if you remember my other videos, the PGC1A, that whole process that activates mitochondrial biogenesis in the first place. The journal of the American College of Nutrition published a study that took a look at 23 males and it put them on um, either a PQQ supplement or a placebo supplement and then it had them do endurance exercise. Well, they found at the end of a few weeks that PQQ didn't have an effect on their endurance capability, but it did have an effect 
on the levels of PGC1A. Okay, so what that means is PQQ, although one would think is going to help as an uh, ergogenic aid, it's going to help you out with performance. It doesn't help with performance, but what it does do is it increases PGC1A, which indirectly is creating more mitochondria. So it's a nice thing to take consistently. Don't take it during a fasting period. Always take it with food. And then the last one that I want to talk about is one that people are probably going to really bag on me about, but this is very particular when you take it. Because I've done many videos saying, do not take this. But I'm always referencing not taking it during a keto day or during fasting. Only take branched chain amino acids if you cannot get enough protein in on a regular eating day. Okay? The reason that I am saying this is branched chain amino acids do trigger an interesting spike in mTOR and subsequently an interesting spike in mitochondrial biogenesis via that PGC1A. Wild stuff because mTOR associated with weight training usually doesn't have much of an effect on biogenesis, more so on mitochondrial coordination and efficiency. So BCAAs probably just give you a quick spike in mTOR, but for whatever reason it's triggering this. Interesting, compelling new science. So I would only take BCAAs along with a meal when you're trying to artificially increase the protein content without increasing your calories. And that's something that you can play around with and mess around with. Tomorrow, in the next video in the series, we talk about the staying lean year round recovery protocol because recovery is very important. We're talking about inflammation, we're talking about when to take days off, things like that. So I'll see you tomorrow for that video.